Mrs. Basega here, and today we're doing the Unit 7 Electrical Circuits Review. So to start off, we have students working on a robot, and part of the robot needs a wire. So one student takes a piece of nichrome wire and measures its resistance using a multimeter. This piece of wire has, an, has a resistance of 12 ohms. If we double the length of the wire from L to 2L, that means electrons would have more interactions with the atoms in their paths. So by doubling the length, this will also double the resistance. Hence, length is in the numerator in the row L over A equation. Doubling the length would double the resistance. So in this case, double the length, double the resistance. The original resistance was 12, so I should be entering 24 ohms. Notice though it says do not include units. That's because this is a numerical problem, and so it's grading it automatically. So I'm going to enter 24. Next, what would the resistance be if we used three strands of wire instead? Notice, using three strands of wire would triple the cross-sectional area. The electrons would have more space to go through, kind of like opening up an extra lane on the highway. If you triple the area, check out what it does in this equation. It puts three in the denominator, so it's one third of the original resistance. Since the original resistance was 12, one third of 12 is four ohms. And again, I'm going to put just the number four with no units. Finally, the student takes a second wire with the same length, but has twice the diameter. And I do want us to be a little bit careful here. We originally used rho L over A as the resistance of a wire, but we could similarly use R L over pi R squared. These two statements are equivalent to each other. So if I double the radius, I actually quadruple the area and quarter the resistance. So if you take a look at what that would look like, imagine I have a much wider circle whose radius and diameter is twice what it was before. When I have twice the radius, then I have rho L over pi 2R squared, I get a one quarter of the original resistance. One quarter of the original 12 is only three ohms. Both these equations with the box on it are good to go. So if you're using open notes, you might as well include both in your notes. Next, number four. What causes the flow of current in an electrical circuit? This is something you're just going to need to know. The resistors don't pull the electrons through. <laughs> the switch doesn't push the electrons through. In fact, you should have noticed from the Ohm's Law lab that whenever you attach a battery, that provides a voltage. And with no voltage, you got no current. It's that this potential difference puts a positive potential near the positive terminal a negative potential near the negative terminal, and that creates an electric field. Imagine that our electrons in the negative terminal repel away from each other until they flow through the circuit. So now let's take a look at Ohm's law since we mentioned it anyways. One of the skills you need to know is how to calculate resistance from a voltage current graph. So let's take a look at wire two, and for this, Please feel free to pick any point of your choice. I'm going to pick one that's nice and easy to work with. I see there's a point that has two amps of current that corresponds to six volts of potential difference. So when I want to find resistance, then I can do our current equals delta V over R, take Ohm's law, and solve for R. The current is two amps. The potential difference is six volts. So the resistance is 6 over 2 is 3. 
Notice that if I put current on one axis and voltage on the other, this means that the slope is equal to the resistance. When we originally did this in our lab, we put voltage on one end and current on the other. And it still gives a linear line. Just be careful to observe which variables are on which axis. So the resistance for wire number two was three ohms. And if I want to draw a wire that has twice the resistance of wire one, I probably should check what the resistance of wire one was. Let's take a similar point on wire one. We have two amps of current corresponding to 12 volts of potential difference. That means for wire one, I'd have two equals 12 over R, or R is equal to six ohms. So if I want to draw a new resistor, that should mean it takes twice as much potential difference to push electrons through the circuit. It means for the same two amps, that this would need to use 24 volts. It should be a steeper line here. We're going up from three to six, doubling that resistance to 12. So this should be at 24 volts. This third resistor has 12 ohms of resistance. Number seven, we're asked to calculate the power and power is calculated by the product of current times voltage. We know that we're using wire number two, and we know that the voltage is going to be 12 volts. So to calculate the power, I need to get the current. So I'm gonna scroll up to the graph. When the voltage is 12, wire two has a current of four. So I have four amps times 12 volts, gives me 48 watts. Now 48 watts is 48 joules per second. So that means it's converting 48 joules of electrical energy into heat every second. Remember, 48 joules per second is the same thing as 48 watts. It's how fast it's converting electrical energy to other forms. Now, when they run out of copper wire, the students want a material that has the same or less resistance. This must mean it has the same or less resistivity than copper. The only one lower than that is silver. Don't get misled by nichrome. Nichrome is actually 150. Nichrome as a material has much higher resistivity than silver or copper. So the only one that has the same or less resistance is silver. Now silver is a great conductor. It's a great conductor because it has very loosely bound electrons. Remember that materials that have tightly bound electrons are insulators. Having more electrons than protons would be talking about a charged item, not necessarily a conductor. And we do know that all materials have electrons. So metals do in fact have electrons. For number 10, this is asking about current. Now DC or direct current is current that leaves from the negative terminal of the battery towards the positive end. So we know it's the electrons flowing. So B must be true. We know that the electrons actually move very slowly through a circuit. Drift velocity is approximately about one millimeter per second even though the energy is very fast. The only one then that is clearly not true is A. Protons can't move because they're bound in the nucleus. And even if they do move, they're only moving a little bit because they have so much more mass than those light, loosely bound electrons. So for number 11, we're going to have one 18 volt battery. It's traditional to label the voltage if you know it, label the positive and negative sign, we have an open switch. An open switch looks kind of like an open drawbridge there. I have one two ohm, one three ohm, and one four ohm resistor. 
and this is connected in series. I can tell this is in series because these all share the same path for electrons to flow. <laughs> that there's actually no current at this point because currently the switch is open. The total current right now is zero. Now the equivalent resistance, that exists whether or not there's voltage or current going through this. So we can calculate this on our own. This is in series. An equivalent resistance in series is the sum of the resistors in the path. So 2 plus 3 plus 4 is 9 ohms. This is a calculating one, so I'm just going to enter the number 9 with no units. So if I know that the switch is closed now, then current is going to flow through. If the switch is closed, then current is going to flow through. And since this acts like one single 9 ohm resistor, I can get the total current in the circuit by taking the voltage divided by equivalent resistance. So that would be 18 divided by 9, or 2 amps. So the total current when the switch is closed is 2. If you get stuck in a problem and you're having trouble picturing it in your head, feel free to grab spare bits of paper, draw your circuit, show your work, draw a chart if you don't have one that's already in front of you. Because in this case, it makes it easier to keep track of the different potential differences and currents and resistance through this circuit. So we already got equivalent resistance of 9. We know the current is 2, and since these are all in series with each other, that 2 amps of current flows through the entire circuit. So that when I want the voltage drop over the 4 ohm resistor, I'm asking for this number. I'm asking for 8. The voltage drop is because R3 uses up some of the potential difference from the 18 volt battery. If you want to solve the rest of this out then, this would be 4 and 6. And just to double check, 4 plus 6 plus 8 does equal 18 over this one closed loop. So the voltage drop over the 4 ohm resistor is 8. The power, ooh, getting tricky here. Power is current times change in potential. So the current over the 4 ohm resistor was 2, the voltage was 8, this power is 16 watts, or 16 joules of energy converted every second. Now question 17 asks about heat, and where that comes from is power. Remember, power is the rate at which energy is converted from electrical energy to other forms. And unless otherwise noted, this is converting this electrical energy into heat. The one with the most heat would be the one with the largest power. And the one with the largest power would still be this 4 ohm resistor. Because think about it, this one's power is 16, this one's power is 12, this one's power is only 8. So the 4 ohm resistor converts electricity to heat at the fastest rate, so that must have the most heat in the circuit. For 18, I'm actually going to do two things side by side. When we add extra resistors in series, adding extra resistors in series is kind of like adding more obstacles in the path of your electrons. If you add more resistors in series, What's going on there is it makes it harder for electrons to flow. And since it's harder to flow, when you add extra resistors in series, equivalent resistance increases. That makes the current decrease. It's harder to flow through more obstacles, so the current itself decreases. And that makes the power also decrease. Having less current means there's fewer particles traveling through the circuit to carry energy. If there's fewer particles carrying energy through, the power is going to be smaller. And I said I was going to do two things at once, right? Because first, we have series, 
which means your equivalent resistance increases, your total current decreases, and total power decreases. But I know that in two seconds we're going to do the same thing in parallel. So what if you added another resistor to a parallel circuit? A parallel circuit can be told apart from a series circuit because each of your resistors has its own path. If I added a fourth resistor here, what happens in parallel is adding an extra resistor makes it easier for electrons to flow. You have more paths, and more paths means more space for electrons to flow. Um, and we'll put easier to flow. That must mean the equivalent resistance decreases, current increases, power increases. That's why it's possible to overload a parallel circuit, but not a series circuit. You can overload a parallel circuit because if you keep adding more and more and more resistors in parallel, the current can get dangerously high and that means the rate that it's turning that electrical energy to heat could become dangerous and start a fire in your walls. So when you add another resistor in parallel, that decreases the equivalent resistance, increasing the total current, and increasing the power. That doesn't mean they're not useful, though. Even though you can overload parallel circuits, they are super useful in household circuits. Notice that in a household circuit, most items are on their own parallel branch of the circuit, except for the circuit breaker or fuse. Circuit breakers are just like fuses, except they're reversible. So this will open the circuit at anything greater than 15 amps, and will keep it closed under normal operating conditions. So let's calculate this equivalent resistance then. I'm recognizing that the blender, microwave, and light are in parallel with each other, and that means their equivalent resistance is equal to 1 over 30 plus 1 over 12 plus 1 over 60, all inverses. Here's where I strongly suggest, if you're doing this equation, to use a calculator or use Desmos so that you can make sure with order of operations that you've put this in correctly. So 1 30th plus 1 12th plus 1 60th, all inverse, equivalent resistance of 7.5. And it says give your answer to one decimal place, so we are good. The total current of the circuit in amps if all the appliances are turned on at the same time. I'm trying to find current. I know this is a typical household circuit, so it provides a 120 volt alternating current over 7.5 ohms of resistance. This gives a 16 amp current. Oh boy, but a thing occurred, right? So if there is 16 amps of current when all of those things are closed and this circuit breaker is only rated to 15, that means the circuit breaker is going to open. The circuit breaker opens kind of like a drawbridge, right? The circuit breaker opens and prevents electrons from flowing through the circuit. So I know it's going to be one of the later ones. So open the circuit. And it's going to open the circuit to protect it from starting a fire. The voltage isn't decreasing. In fact, this is a standard outlet. The 120 volts. AC is constant. It's always there. So the voltage isn't decreasing. We're trying to stop fires. <laughs> if you haven't done so already, draw out a circuit problem so that you have some sort of thing to go off of. Don't just try to solve all of these in your head. <laughs> we already found the equivalent resistance. We already know the total current is 16. Because all of these are in parallel with each other, and in parallel with the power supply, I expect the voltage drop is 120 at all the appliances, which really is one thing we like about parallel circuits, because now we can build uniform appliances that all take potential differences of 120. 
To get the current through the microwave then, I'm looking for this value, and I can solve it by solving Ohm's law across this row. So I'm still doing current is delta V over R, but delta V is 120. R of just that part of the circuit is 12. And I can do that in my head. 120 divided by 12 is 10 amps. This takes up 10 amps of the available 16. So the microwave in amps is 10. The power for the microwave in watts, we're going back to power. Power is the product of current and voltage. So that would be 10 amps of current times 120 volts gives 1,200 watts, or 1,200 joules per second of energy being converted into other forms. So that's 1,200 watts. Now, for number 29, don't get distracted by the extra terms here. I've seen people do things like calculate it if your microwave ran for an entire year. <laughs> but this is only a microwave running for five hours per month. So let's figure out how many hours this is. Time in hours, if it runs five hours per month and there are 12 months in a year, this microwave runs something like 60 hours. So when I wanna go find the energy in kilowatt hours, I'm also gonna need this power to stop being in watts and start being in kilowatts. I can do that by dividing by a thousand. This is 1.2 kilowatts. So finally, energy in kilowatt hours, energy is power times time, friends. So that's 1.2 kilowatts times 60 hours or 72 kilowatt hours. Number 30, household circuits only need two wires in order to make a complete circuit. Household wiring has a third wire called the ground. And the idea behind the ground is that it prevents electrocution of people if one of the wires in the appliance breaks. There are parts of your house that need 240 volts, but those have special outlets in order to do that. That's not the case. You'll notice that all outlets have a third hole for your ground wire, and you'll notice that that's usually included for appliances that need lots of current. So I have a ground wire in my dishwasher, there's a ground wire in the vacuum cleaner, something that carries a lot of current, where if the appliance breaks, it could shock or electrocute or hurt me. It doesn't stop the flow of current if there's a short circuit, that would be either your circuit breaker or fuse, and the voltage in your appliance is going to be 120 volts at any normal outlet. Almost done. Let us break apart this complex circuit. In the circuit diagram, R2 and R3 are in series with each other. So I'm going to tackle them first when doing equivalent resistance. Because they are clearly in series with each other, that means their equivalent resistance of resistor 2 and 3 together would be 6 plus 6 or 12 ohms. Notice my steps. I identified, I'm solving equivalent resistance here for my small section. Now let's do the redraw and replace. I'm gonna draw the same exact circuit, except in place of R2 and R3, I'm gonna draw one 12 ohm resistor. Two and three subscript is just indicating that I'm replacing resistors two and three with their equivalent resistance. So now what do we do? I've done the replace and redraw, that is step three, and now we restart. I'm not down to one resistor yet, so let's do the next step. Next, I'm gonna address the part that's all in parallel. So I'm gonna identify that these two resistors are in parallel with each other. In parallel means that their equivalent resistance is 1 over R23 plus 1 over R4, all inverse. So that's 1 over 12 plus 1 over 4, all inverse. In Desmos, I would make sure I'm putting parentheses. 
I'm make sure to put a close and then finally to the negative one power at the end. The equivalent resistance here is three ohms. And I can see when I do my redraw that I am almost done. When I do my redraw, I'm trying to keep R1 in place. I didn't use it yet, so I'm going to keep it exactly where it was in the circuit. But R3, 4, and 2 are all going to be between these two junctions. Imagine I'm replacing them exactly where they were in the circuit before. I'm going to replace them right there. So I'm going to replace that with one 3 ohm resistor that I'm going to call R234. All three of those resistors together have an equivalent resistance of 3. Oh, but we're not done yet. I did my identify. I calculated the equivalent resistance. I replaced and redraw. But we're not down to one resistor yet, so last one. I identify that these two are in series with each other, which means I can add up their resistances. This is a resistance of 2 plus 3 is 5 ohms total. So equivalent resistance for the complex circuit is 5. For number 33, this is getting us to identify series, parallel, and voltage rules. In this case, the two circuit elements that have the same current as each other are C, D, and the battery. So I'm going to select C and D here. I know that C, D, and the battery have the same current as each other because they're all along the same path as each other. Notice how electrons flowing through would all have to go through the same path, so those must have the same current. C, D, and the battery are in series with each other, whereas A and B are in parallel with each other, so they must have the same voltage drop. Number 35. If light bulb A burns out, well, A burns out, but path B is still open, so electrons will continue to flow. A will turn off. B, C, and D will remain on. It won't stop the current. It won't leak out. It's not water. <laughs> so the current in the circuit will actually decrease as a result of this. And if you want to try this out for yourself, just assign a resistance of 2 or some other easy to work with number for you to each light bulb. You'll find that when A is there, the equivalent resistance for the circuit is only 5 ohms. But when you take resistor A out, it actually makes a higher equivalent resistance, 6 ohms. So this means current would go down, power would decrease, and it would all get dimmer. So the current in the circuit decreases because your equivalent resistance increased. OK, let us do the circuit Sudoku then. So in this case, I've made one for myself so I can draw on top of it. You can totally do your work inside this table area over here. But I know that later, I'm going to ask you to explain how you found the current through each one. So keep those in the back of your head as we go. As I'm looking at this circuit, I most want to deal with current. And I'm thinking current because when I look at this, I realize that I know more about current than I do about voltage. And I definitely can't calculate equivalent resistance because I only know two of four resistors. So let us follow the current on a journey. I see four amps of current go through R1. And if I go from here, that 4 amps is going to flow into this junction. When it reaches the junction, I see that 1 amp flows over R3. But that same 1 amp must have flowed everywhere along this outside path. So I'm going to complete this circle right here. And let's check. Kirchhoff's junction law says that if 4 amps goes in and 1 amp goes right, that R2 must have 3 amps down. Kirchhoff's junction law is a statement of conservation of charge. And I can tell because amperes are proportional to coulombs. This says 4 coulombs of charge enters this junction every second. 
If 3 coulombs goes this way and 1 coulomb goes this way, those must still add up to 4. Recombining at this junction, R4 must also have 4 amps of current. Hey, and those electrons in that current still flow up through the battery. By addressing current first, I now know the whole center column. I knew that R2 had 3 amps of current. I know that R4 had 4 amps, and I knew that the battery had 4 amps. So now, let's use Ohm's law to multiply across rows as needed. Each row has to obey Ohm's law. So I can find the voltage drop over R2 was 3 times 4 is 12. I can see the resistance of R1 is 16 divided by 4 is 4. I see the voltage drop over R4 is 2 times 4 is 8. And next, let's deal with the voltages. I still can't calculate equivalent resistance because I don't know this value. So let's deal with voltages. All right, I'm noticing here that R2 and R3 are in parallel with each other. And that means I'm going to put a little box around them. That box is to remind me later not to double count these voltages when I do Kirchhoff's loop law. Both of these have a voltage of 12, but an electron can only be in one of those paths at once. So when I go use loop law to calculate the total voltage put out by the battery, then I don't want to count both of the 12s. In fact, let's write out loop law for a second. Loop law says that for any closed loop, the voltage put out by the battery has to be equal to the voltage used up along the path. Now for the path, let's say I define a path where current is flowing through R1, R2, and R4. I don't need to count R3 because it can only go over one of those paths at a time. The voltage from the supply then is equal to 16 plus 12 plus 8 or 36 volts. 36 volts would give our potential difference from the power supply and it doesn't matter if I have defined the loop using R2 or R3, it only counts the 12 once. That box is there to remind me I'm not doing 16 plus 12 plus 12 plus 8. That doesn't equal 36. Solving across this row then, we can get the resistance of resistor 3 is 12. And we can get the equivalent resistance of this circuit is 9. Here's a check though. If you've done this right, I should be able to take my four resistors that I just found and double check that this equivalent resistance is correct. So let's do that. Well, I would tackle the two parallel branches first. These two together would have an equivalent resistance of 1 fourth plus 1 twelfth, all inverse. And well, that's just a 3. Replacing and redrawing that in the circuit, my 4 ohm resistor and 2 ohm resistor stay in place. But I'm going to replace at that junction with a 3 ohm resistor. That means 4 plus 3 plus 2, the equivalent resistance of this circuit is 9, and I can be pretty confident that I've done that correctly. I can be pretty confident because that means in both the solving the whole circuit, circuit Sudoku problem, and double checking with equivalent resistance, I'm getting two equal values. So last step then, we're going to explain how we got things. So it says, explain how you found the current through R2. I found the current through R2 by junction law. I knew that 4 amps flowed into the junction, 1 amp flowed through R3. That means 3 amps must have 
flowed through R2. And now I'm just going to make this nice and readable. There we go. Check. Explain how you found the voltage for resistor 3. Well, resistor 3 had the same voltage as resistor 2, which I had found earlier. So when I go show my work here, I'm going to type an explanation in this case. Resistors 2 and 3 are in parallel and therefore have the same voltage as each other. I found R2 to have a voltage drop of 12, so R3 must also have a voltage drop of 12. I'm going to go make that more readable and check. Explain how you found the current through R4. Well, remember, I did junction rule again for there. In this case, let's do a drawing one. I found the current through R4 because 3 amps plus 1 amp recombined to make 4 amps. In this case, 4 amps flowed through R4 when the currents recombined. So the currents recombined at the junction, making a total of 4 amps to flow through R4. Finally, the total voltage for the cell. This is the work we did over here. So we did loop law with a change in potential from the battery equaling to the sum of the voltage drops over the resistors in its path. Ta-da! Best of luck for everyone.